Zach here from Gravel Bike California in the northern stretches of the Sierra as we're about to ride up and above Butte Meadows. Now, the city below might be known for its world famous brewery that shares the namesake of these mountains. But John Bidwell founded Chico around the time of the Civil War. And as part of that, he helped extend the California Trail by directing people onto the Humboldt Wagon Road. Now, things have obviously changed over time, but not getting over all this elevation. No doubt this ride will be beautiful. Let's roll. Our tale starts in Chico, an hour and a half drive north of Sacramento, as John Bidwell settled in the area in 1841 after being one of the first travelers of the California Trail. He founded Chico in 1860, followed by the eviction of the native Maidu to Round Valley three years later, as his impact to the area shows in many ways, including his mansion built in 1868, which is adjacent to the land he donated to create the Northern Branch of the California State Normal School in 1887, which was later renamed Chico State. He also conceived the Humboldt Toll Road going through the Sierra to connect Chico to the mines of Nevada and Idaho, with Butte Meadows established in the 19th century along the route, but as Highway 32 was built in the 1930s, Humboldt Road became far quieter. I connected with Mehdi, who put this group together, with Evan from A-Main Cycling, and Tom, who mapped out the route. Running clockwise, this 37-mile loop was over 70% dirt with steady climbing, reaching over 4,000 feet of gain. We started off with a quick turn onto Scout Road, which I'm guessing got its name from the BSA camp, as the first six miles was of the off-road variety with early portions of open space thanks to logging. But you wouldn't know it too much from the conditions of the surface as the start was on the smoother side, allowing us to take advantage of some early downhill. Easing up, I was thinking this was a suspicious way of starting a ride, kind of like not talking to a pitcher throwing a no-hitter, as I wish for the same standard the rest of the ride. Our time on Scout Road and did turning onto pavement, converging onto the earlier mentioned Highway 32, and while we were rolling downhill, we were really about to go downhill, as the next four miles was going to average what the sign says meaning we were going to hit the dirt with less tread than we started, fulfilling our need for speed, causing short opportunities to look out. But I was developing an unfounded complaint that this ride was going by too fast, which was combated by Murphy's Law, as it's easy to miss the dirt at these speeds. I had no doubt Tom had us on the right path. Although I wish someone warned me to bring a chainsaw, as we started our climb up Rattlesnake Creek, which fortunately was a misnomer on this ride, starting the first half of this climb, averaging a little over 6% for three miles, and coming across other logging roads too. But every direction out here was giving me smiles, even when the pitch got to us. And while the area is heavily forested, there are plenty of opportunities for these expansive views, and you'll even hit the brakes to prolong them. While the Rattlesnake Creek climb shows up on Strava as an eight mile climb of the category one variety, I don't think there's any complaints with this one mile descent baked in, especially being in the middle of all the smoothness as it ended without notice of crossing Rattlesnake Creek. Back to the climb. Yeah. We began our longest continuous stretch of climbing at four straight miles at just under 7% characterized by long switchback turns and some unique overgrowth to keep us boxed in. But no complaints with the steadiness, 
as it's good to fall into a rhythm, causing me to keep my head down for moments. But as the stretch contains outward views and how these infrequent opportunities just frame the sky, we wrapped up this climb efficiently as we are now treading in mile high territory. The next six miles continued on as rollers, calmly putting down the miles through the alleyway of trees. And as from someone from the outside looking in, I didn't expect these great conditions somewhere this remote, yet I was starting to take it for granted. But we were also starting to get some payback at this elevation in the form of longer distance views assisted by a lightening of tree density, leading to a proper stop to look out towards Lassen Peak and its surrounding national park, which even prompted me to visit this active volcano on my drive out. And the return to pedal pushing was brief again, interrupted by another Kodak moment, looking up at the rideable Colby Mountain, broken up by some fun descending, cause it was starting to feel left out. While I didn't catch the markings at the five-way intersection, it was time for a switch up single track style, putting it down on the Colby Meadows Trail, a two and a half mile interlude from the fire road, which is well maintained even with all the downed trees and falls within the Sierra Butte Trail Stewardship's Connected Communities Study Area. But while conditions were good, there are spots with tight turns and a little bumpiness along the way but our highlight reel just continued to grow. Colby Meadows Trail ended back onto the fire load at a convenient spot to filter out water from the creek of the same namesake and a good time to make sure everything was in working order. With still 10 miles left, we had to hold firm there was no horsing around as we enjoyed every last morsel of dirt, as maybe the end finished up too quickly, even though we took the long way around. But this didn't mean the fun was over because the adventure aspect was going to continue turning off onto the modern asphalt of Humboldt Road. It was quite a change being on this thoroughfare not just because the speeds with six miles of downhill left, but also we were rolling by structures for the first time and stopping at a few carrying some significant history. Coming across the Jonesville Hotel under renovation, built in the 1860s, and is the last remaining way station out of the 14, which locals have been pitching in to repair. As the Jonesville Hotel was worthy of creating a traffic jam of its own, this was as rural as it can get Yet I didn't feel isolated, with residences tucked away when you looked over. But we soon came across Butte Creek, leading to a unique water stop, taking a little more work than your typical fountain, but a far more stylish way of filling up. Now we may not have needed that water to finish up the ride, and it's probably convenient to use more for fishing, but we soon formally re-entered Butte Meadows, as it was apparent how it got its name and coming across the sign, and I was a sucker for one more stop, visiting the former site of the Diamond Match logging camp, where families lived out of these smallish cabins for six months, for 17 years in the early part of the century, with only a few relics remaining. But there's still other opportunities to check out, once hitting Butte Meadows Central, as we headed into the tank house, polishing off a great morning of riding, cooling off, in more ways than one. This ride checked all the boxes. First of all, the roads themselves were fantastic. And they're everywhere. So I only got a small smidgen of them. Second of all, you go across California, I don't think you're ever too far from people. You can plan out in a gravel bike and connect it and just go ahead and find these other communities. I tell you, this was a great first step here in the Northeast corner. Just makes me want to come out, keep exploring. If you want to help support us, go ahead and hit them to our subscribe button or go to Patreon or snag some great gear at our shop so we can bring you more. State of Dirt. <laughs>